RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Today on our tea break, we're joined by John. John, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for having me. Our paths crossed, didn't they, last weekend at an expo where you produced from nowhere a device with a piece of software on that, well, it wowed us all. It really got my interest. It got the interest of um, Stu Cambridge from Sensible Software was there. He was enthralled by it. Uh, Chris Wilkins from Fusion Books. As soon as they saw what you were doing, um, I think it grabbed us all because it took us back to a time in computing where we all began, really, a time when we turned a machine on, the prompt appeared within seconds that said ready, and that was it. The world was your oyster. You could load a game or you could just start programming there and then. Um, yeah. And I don't think I'm alone. And from the reaction that we saw of people there in saying that I miss that. Is it the same for mm. you? Uh, yes, very much so. I, I, I think you're referring to uh, this. Yes. Yeah. So that's Not a Nintendo Switch. There, but, uh, my Nintendo Switch with them. Um, a special application running on that called uh, uh, Fuse for Nintendo Switch. And uh, the idea was originally, um, and this is actually back in 2012, that could we recreate that environment where um, a, a programming environment was instantly accessible? And actually, it was because of the language basic and on all those 8-bit micros that you just start them up and you'd have a ready prompt coming up on the screen. And you just started typing and you made mistakes and you got feedback and you learned why and off you went and you started learning. Um, and that accessibility has been really painfully uh, um, lacking now for a, a long time. Um, and actually, some people maybe tell me off for this one, but uh, bad luck. Um, really, it started to go downhill, in my, my opinion, from the Atari um, ST and the Commodore Amiga, where there was just an extra layer or two put in place that took away some of that immediacy of, of that uh, being able to code instantly. And then shortly after that, I mean, it kind of winged out the wannabes as well, which is at the time was probably quite a good thing because then the, the really advanced coders came along with, you know, um, programming on the 68,000 and stuff and really turning out some great looking games and products. Um, but then it got worse. The consoles um, arrived and the Nintendo NES, um, uh, and the, you know, the Nintendo NES and SNES and 64 where my uh, heart lines, but they really removed uh, access to coding and the Windows PC and the Apple Mac as well, just really put it behind the scenes. And so then we spent the next 20 odd years not learning to code or not so many people learning to code. And we come back to a situation now where the governments, um, the globe over are saying uh, what went wrong. We have this problem, we've got no coders coming through education. Uh, we're relying upon a bunch of 50-year-old pluses um, to provide most of the coding skills throughout the, uh, the world sort of thing. Um, and, and wondering what happened and then making a, quite a few different uh, attempts at fixing the problem. And personally, I don't think they've made the best, um, best choices. Mm. So the idea was, was, could we recreate that environment? Could we make a computer, actually? Um, sorry, I'll, I'll get one up. This was it. So could we um, make a, a full-blown um, sort of retro computer device that gave people um, access to a programming language as quickly as possible? So the, we, the Fuse sorry. that you showed me is on the, on the Switch, but yes. this is not the first iteration of Fuse no, no, then, no. so this goes no. back some years. Yeah, in 2012, we sort of put together a design for a, a workstation computer, um, which was based on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, in fact, originally it wasn't. It was based on a Maximite board, which was uh, even better, but not quite as accessible to everybody. Um, and we took it to the education channel. We went to a few education shows, and it was kind of freaky. We were um, nominated as the finalist, as a finalist in the Bet Show for most innovative product for two years running. Uh, people just falling over it, saying, "Well, this is awesome. Someone's really doing something cool with the Raspberry Pi. You make it more accessible." But all the time, the point was can we get it in front of the kids? And so we really pushed it into the education channel. And we have done okay with that. We've sold about 5,000 units. We've got over 400 schools using diffuse computers. Um, and that's all well and good, but it didn't quite hit, uh, mm. didn't quite get out to as many people as I really would have liked it to. Yeah, I think it's definitely telling you something, isn't it? When you win an award for innovation, 
with a system which is something that was in our primary schools in the 80s, basic programming. Yeah, and it even looks like it. Yeah. You know, it even looks like a computer from the 1980s, which just makes it... I mean, there's a positive and negative there. You've got a lot of young teachers, primary school teachers, probably average around 25 years old, and, and you see this and it's a big, clunky retro device. It made our lives harder, a much harder sell once they'd seen it. And, and how the kids reacted to it and, and the, how easily and quickly they're learning, then they're all very happy with it. So, um, But the, the point was it, it didn't get to the numbers that we would have really liked it to. And that's not a commercial uh, statement. It's, you know, we want to get kids coding. It's a real passion for, for our company. Um, and so we approached Nintendo, and specifically the Nintendo Switch, because the device itself is... Um, just the most accessible in terms of powerful gaming console um, that's available now. You, you hold it in your hands. You can do that in the bedroom, downstairs on the sofa. And you can you can play it on the loo if you want. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and this is sorry. this is what stunned us when we saw you at that expo because, as you mentioned earlier, the consoles, the, the NES, uh, the SNES, mm. etc. It was a closed system. There was no way of programming at all. So when you said well, we've partnered with Nintendo. We, we all thought, what, Nintendo? <laughs> well, For a start, we were amazed that they would um, allow it because obviously there's the risk if you're introducing a programming language to something like the Switch of opening up exploits and things yes. like that. But from what you yes. told us, they've actually been really, really good to work with. Well, I think even to say they've embraced the idea is an understatement. They've, they've been incredibly supportive. Um I think there are a couple of, a couple of reasons why. One that we don't speak about, which is, um, <laughs> which I'll speak about. <laughs> um, we can, with Fuse on the Switch, you can write your own games. And actually, you can write games of a very, very high standard. Um, and if you didn't have that and you wanted to do that, then you need to resort to uh, hacking devices and opening them up so you can start running Homebrew on them. And um, whilst Homebrew is just one of the greatest things ever, um, obviously hacking a console can be seen as a negative thing, and it certainly doesn't help you in, in um, getting the best use out of your console. Once it's hacked, it becomes difficult to do other things with it. Um, this allows you to do that legally, actually. It's an anti-hacking um, <laughs> application in, in many ways. And so whilst that's not openly discussed, I think... You know, that has to be one of the deciding factors for Nintendo to say, well, this is a good idea because it stops that need or it certainly helps stop that need. Yeah. Um, but the other side is it opens up other channels. You know, I mean, Nintendo are really rapidly moving into education anyway with the Nintendo, with the um, the Labo hardware. And I'm confident that there'll be lots more in, in that area in education. So this is very much a complementary product mm -hmm. with other things that Nintendo are working towards. So... Um, and it's all about games and it's all about kids. It's about young kids and, and gaming, yeah. you know, so yeah. it kind of does sit very well. Yeah. So Fuse then in its current form on the Nintendo Switch, just to take us through it then, um, you know, what's the interface like if, if we wanted to just start programming? Because it's not like, say, um, we had things like click and play where you sort of dragged and dropped yeah, that's, that's, well, that's a really old reference. <laughs> There's probably much yeah, more up-to-date references. Um, to I know that. the I know the product. I remember <laughs> it. I remember the box. In fact, I think I even used to sell it on Tottenham Court Road back in the late eighties. <laughs> but it's um, it's not like that, is it? No, it's not. And uh, there's there's a couple of things. One one of the objectives um, was very much to see how quickly, after turning on your switch and having your menu in front of you, how quickly can we get you to a page of code? And in the case of the switch, uh, it's about three seconds because it will automatically go to your last open program. Now, that's close to running on a, uh, a BBC Micro or Commodore 64, or whatever. You're just there to, uh, with your code in front of you instantly. Um, so actually, if you wanted to make a direct comparison to the over 35s and the over 40s of us, then you would say it is the equivalent of STOS or AMOS mm -hmm. um, on the Amiga and the Atari ST. And I, I say that because... It's, it's basically um, the language basic on steroids that are on steroids. Um, it, you know, in terms of all the sort of blitting and, and sprite commands and moving 3D objects around and animation and audio and everything else, they're all there as built-in commands for you, um, but you still have to learn how to 
make use of them and, and code them. And that very much was what uh, Stoss and Amos was about, was to really ramp up what you could do in BASIC. Um, there is a, or there was a severe limitation um, with BASIC, and that was that it's an interpreted language. So it, it really slows everything down. And when you're trying to do really complex things with graphics and audio and whatever, um, being an interpreted language just really pulls it down even further. So with this, all of that is handled for you. The interpreter, well, we're now running on multi-gigahertz processors and we've got <laughs> practically unlimited RAM and, and accelerated graphics hardware. The interpreter is no longer uh, anywhere near the hindrance that it used to be. In fact, we can create games with you know, 500, 800 sprites uh, flying around the screen at 30 frames a second with 3D models animating and running around the screen in a language which is based on basic. Yeah, yeah, it's really impressive. And what I like about it as well is you say you get into it really quickly, but I know you're aiming this at all ages, but specifically to get it into schools and kids as well, but you're not patronizing them. You're just giving them in a development environment. There's no um, there's no Nintendo Mies walking around the screen pointing <laughs> out what you should do and shouldn't do. No. It's, it's, it's quite raw, isn't it? Very different. Um, and it's partly because of, a, of an experience. Well, it's, it's, it's an experience across two ages. Uh, when I am, and people of my age grew up in the, um, or, or grew up with computers in the 80s, um, it wasn't simple, it wasn't dumbed down, it was very raw, but actually that's what made it so accessible. We, in the last uh, five or six years, we, we've delivered over 600 workshops um, to children and uh, teachers and parents, but the majority of um, uh, children aged between six and uh, 90. Um, we, in every case, in every workshop, we're teaching them how to code in, in a text-based language. And it, again, it is raw. We just put kids in front. Before you know it, they're typing in Hello World. Then they're changing the, si the, the sizes and getting random colors and learning about loops. And then we introduce variables. And then we introduce if-then statements. And within an hour, very often, they've uh, achieved more learning than they will have achieved in a, in a term. Of, of a standard sort of, um, I don't want to be little primary schools, they do an incredible job, but the, how they are supposed to bring this um, to uh, this skill without training, without experience and without access to decent tools, I don't know. So anything that I say is negative to them is not, it's negative to the environment they have to uh, work in and, and try and get the best out of. Yeah. And what, what we're doing here is providing a tool that achieves that. But, so the point was, is that we're very used to it being raw. We've seen the results. We've seen kids as young as six, but certainly the seven, eight, nine, tens um, just thrive, just like kids did in the 80s. Just thrive. They can get it. They know what a variable does. They know what a loop does. And, you know, if you say to a child, uh, if I am hungry, then what? Eat. OK, so if raining, then put on bread up. And within a few seconds, they've got the concept and you apply it then to if I press this joystick button, jump. Yeah, yeah. Brains like sponges. I remember Absolutely. myself. I mean, we had the BBC Micro and um, whether or not the teachers got specific training, I don't know, but they were certainly supported by the Computers for School project. So there were videos to back it up. Yes. I know that you've got a very good help system built in. Yeah. Um, but for those kids that have may perhaps a, a shorter attention span and can't make it to your workshops, are you yes. planning on doing sort of YouTube videos or tutorial yes. videos? Yeah, uh, very, very much so. It's um, I mean, we, we, we have a couple of issues that uh, uh, will hold us back initially. I mean, we're, we're a very small company. We're only, um, I think in total, actually six, but there's only four on the core team. And that's um, uh, two programmers, one main programmer here, one in um, one secondary in the States. Uh, we have a, a 3D graphic artist. We have a, um, an audio engineer who also does all the help files. And you've got me sort of holding those things together. Mm -hmm. um, to produce... Uh, a lot of um, community video work is going to take us some effort, but um, believe me, we're on it. Yeah, <laughs> we have yeah. a green screen room all set up, we've got the lighting all set up, and we're ready to go. We've just got to get the product finished. Yeah, and I imagine also what you're perhaps secretly wishing for or hoping for, or maybe even publicly, is that a community the likes of which sprung up around, say, Blitz Basic or Dark yep. Basic will come yep. and then they can be, you know, self helping and self fulfilling. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think I've probably mentioned when I met, um, my background in this um, goes perhaps a bit deeper in, um, into what we're doing, in that back in the year 2000, 99, 2000, 2001, I ran a company called Fast Track, 
at Fast Track Software Publishing. And we published uh, exclusively uh, two or three products. One was Viv Game Studio, which was very much what we're doing now, but also Dark Basic and um, uh, uh, Dark Basic Professional. Hello to Rick and Lee, if you happen to see this. Um, be nice to catch up. Um, so there, there were those. We also used to publish the EJ uh, Music Range. Oh, I remember, yeah, so yeah. Just to give some maybe some context to it. But you know, back then we very rapidly built up a community. Um, we had about six, uh, in between six and eight thousand members um, of, of young people submitting projects to our website that they would then uh, pass comments on, rate. Um, download and play, put in their, in their own projects and, and everybody just working together and little teams building up of, um, you know, I'm a programmer, but I need someone to do some uh, Zelda type graphics or some something music wise. And, and really, again, that's very much what we want to achieve. So that's another aspect of something we have to put together now quite, quite soon, but it's a big community presence supporting um, uh, the product. And I should say that, um, Fuse is not going to be limited to, it's not an exclusive Nintendo title. We already have a version on Windows. Um, I'd almost rather people didn't uh, download it because it's it's a very different product. It's very uh, akin to the original basic and it's somewhat more limited and it's a, it's a bit slower. And it doesn't have the fantastic media or the assets and game contents that we have, but you can download Fuse Basic for free, it's on Windows, and, and um, all the content and resources were also free. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Well, John, um, our 15 minutes have flown by. Um, wow. You've achieved a huge amount. I didn't realise your team was quite so small, so it's even even more <laughs> impressive what you've achieved. Mm. Um, just before we end the chat, just tell us very quickly when and how can we get hold of uh, Fuse sure. for the Switch? Okay, so all things um, going to plan, so not. Um, we are aiming for the 12th of July. The product will be then available from the Nintendo eShop um, for $29.99. Um, I should, if I can just very quickly add, it is accompanied by uh, just about one of, certainly one of the largest collections of gaming assets, whether you're talking about little sprites or 3D models or audio clips and sound effects and music and so on. It's an astonishing amount of content. Um, and also tools, so image editors to create sprites and map editors so you can lay out everything and put collision boxes on to, to make platform levels and so on. So it's very much a, a games coding studio. Excellent. Um, if you'd like it to be seen as. Mm. Great. Well, what I'll do, John, is um, I'll edit some pictures of the ID and the assets oh. and things over our chat so people will have seen them um, as we've been talking with a few captions. John, thank you very much for taking the time to chat to us today and I uh, wish you the very best of luck with your release. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Jim. Thank you. Cheers. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.